The first question is uh, how and when did you get to know Busgalian? Yeah, so I first met him when I came to Moscow to one of his conferences. Simply that. And then I got to know him more because he uh, sent me some work which he was submitting the Cambridge um, Economic, uh, what's it called? Cambridge Economic, Cambridge Economic Journal, I think. Which uh, I sent to him, and I helped him with, with doing that that that, that article. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what uh, theoretical developments uh, the provisions of the post-Soviet school of critical Marxism uh, by Buzgarin uh, are closest to you, and what uh, would you argue with that requires uh, refinement and uh, development? Yeah, well, I think what Buzgarin tried to do was to examine modern societies as they are from a Marxist point of view. So he didn't carry with him a lot of ideological and historical baggage from the 19th century. Although he was aware of these problems, what he tried to do was to imagine that he would Marx and he'd be looking at the society now and trying to explain how one would move from capitalism to socialism under present conditions. And that, I think, is the major contribution of what you might call the Marxist, the uh, Moscow School of Marxism. I think there's a tendency in the Marxist movement for people to idealize things like the Paris Commune or like the October Revolution, and to see how those events can somehow um, act as, a, uh, as an example in some ways for how things should change now. But Bizzoli never did that. He tried to say, well, what are the dynamics? What are the class forces? What are the political interests? And how do you move from this stage to the next stage? That, I think, is the major contribution of a way of looking at things. I think a lot of the Marxist movements now, they've taken on a lot of other baggage from um, critical leftist positions, like uh, race, like feminism, for instance, like diversity. I'm not saying those things are wrong. They're coming from a leftist position, they aren't necessarily socialist positions. Now, you can have diversity and you can have um, a critique, say, of racism. It doesn't lead to socialism. And that's one thing I think I found with Buzgalin, that he was really concerned with looking at what are the social movements now. Uh, so, uh, how do you see the future development of Marxism in the world as a whole, uh, in your country, and its uh, polarity, uh, taking into account of modern uh, social problems? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I think that what um, the contribution of the school was to, to look at what the ascendant political and economic forces are. And in this respect, what Buzgalin and the Moscow Marxist School do is to look at the development of the productive forces and particularly to look at the development of high-level kinds of technology and the class forces that go with it. I think that is a major contribution of um, Buzgalin and his other followers. I think the problem with that is, although I think that's an extremely important question, the problem is to what extent are these, are these new developments in the productive forces leading to class forces that are going to move towards socialism? And that's where I think well, I'm a bit critical of, of Buzgalin. Um, I think he was too hopeful that these forces would, would materialize in that way. My own 
view is that these particular these forces, these economic developments are important, but I don't see very much evidence of a socialist political consciousness developing. In other words, what I think has happened is that these, these economic and political forces have somehow been integrated into the existing structure of capitalism. So it doesn't become a critique in a way that, say, the, the, the bourgeoisie, when it arose, it became a critique of the feudal society. And if you go back to the 19th century, the development of the working class, that became a critique of the capitalist system. But what has happened is that with the decline of the traditional working class, these new class forces, which Husgalin and his uh, followers have developed, they don't seem to me to be leading in, in this direction at all. So maybe you could give me your question again. I, I, that was part of the first question. No, that, that's okay. Hmm. So, uh, can we say that now comes a key moment in the trajectory of the development of uh, capitalism? Uh, should we expect uh, drastic changes in its model in the near future? Well, I think we've had drastic changes, very important changes, uh, which led to the decline of the, the Soviet model of, uh, of socialism. And that coincided also with a significant decline in the social democratic alternative. The social democratic alternative, as I say in my book, that declined really at the same time that the, social, the, social, the, the, so, the Soviet socialist model also declined. And I think that this did represent a very important change in the, the nature of capital, well not in the nature of capitalism, but in the social forces. In other words, that with the development of the tertiary industries, with the movement away from the traditional um, forces, social forces which supported socialism, and there didn't seem to be anything which replaced it. And you had the development of consumer type society. And this form, form of society has really captured, captured the masses in a way in which Marxists hoped that socialism would capture the masses in the early days. So I think we are at um, I don't, uh, m my feeling is that since about the 1980s, um, so with, I think the, the real break was in the fall, was in, I, do, I don't say that the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the dismantling of the Soviet Union by the political leadership of uh, the USSR, that was a major break. And other f social forces went with it, political forces. The rise of uh, new labor, for instance, in the, in, in the West. The, the, the rise of these very revisionist um, socialist part, um, social democratic parties. The social democratic critique um, was replaced effectively by a liberal critique. Uh, so I think that from the end of the 19th century, from 20th century, from about 1970, 1980, things then began to began to develop. It's also paralleled in China with the, their move to the market, their move to private property. So there's been this very big movement at the end of the 20th century. And I think the problem is it hasn't been replaced by a further socialist critique. And that many of the uh, socialist activists have been taken up in, in with other issues with uh, issues, I say, of race, um, of feminism, um, of the third world, for instance, of now with the problem of um, the, uh, the uh, global warming um, and these kinds of environmental problems. So these have become really at the center of the attention of a lot of um, what you might call leftist views. So the left is no longer a socialist left. It is really a critical liberal, liberal West now. It's a, a critical liberal movement. I think that is the problem. And Bruce Garland did 
move in the direction of trying to correct that. And I think that is his legacy. Uh, so, so what do you think of those ideas then? Who knows? Uh, what changes in the field of uh, creative uh, work have been most uh, significant in uh, recent years uh, from uh, your point of view? Creative work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think creative work is one thing, but I think that you have to look at the way in which work and way in which um, innovation and development takes place. And I'm skeptical of this view that you look at the individual worker, the individual artist, I think what you have to do, you have to look at the way in which corporations now are acting in, in the form of creating innovation, creating development, creating new products. So it's not a matter of, in, of individual activities now, it's a matter of corporate developments. And those corporate developments really don't overlap with, with individuals and one has to grapple with this in some way. The, the corporatization of innovation, for instance, I mean, I've been to this conference today and one doesn't really hear anything about this kind of corporate, corporatization the development, say, of Oh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe you've got the development of CERN, for instance, looking at the ways in which particle physics is developing. But a lot of these developments in artificial intelligence and so on, they're not the consequence of individual activities, they're the consequence of very big groups who are working together, or of individuals working within these types of corporate organizations. And that is something which one has to grapple with if one is going to understand these things. About artificial intelligence will be my next question. Uh -huh. uh, so, how is uh, modern technology, artificial intelligence, uh, advancements is in uh, cognitive science uh, and uh, or social science uh, recent, uh, recently influenced uh, the understandable or the very essence of uh, creative work? Of the what? Of the creative work. Creative work. Work. <clears throat> well, I think it's one aspect of it. Yes. Um, I think obviously it's at the, at the forefront, and as I said in my earlier piece, that this these developments are largely taking place within the corporate sector that uh, one looks in vain for the individual entrepreneurial kind of activity. So I think that's very much, um, it doesn't seem to be part of what you might call an ascendant, an ascendant class. And this is again where I think I'm a bit critical of the, of the Bruce Garland approach and looking at the creative class as, an, as a, a, a as an ascendant class. I think it's very important, but a lot of the people in the, in the creative classes are doing relatively routine work, for example, though they may have high qualifications. There's not a great deal of creativity in many of these activities, these non-manual, like high-level activities, say even in computing. There's a lot of run-of-the-mill activities going on there. But well, I think the real problem is, is the corporatization of innovation, the corporatization of the, the rise of this new creative class. It's all part of, part of the, 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 the constitution of capitalism, of advanced capitalism. And that's what I think you have to grapple with. And that's a very difficult problem. So, uh, now maybe we'll uh, have to talk a little bit about the uh, agenda of the uh, Economic Congress. So, what is the uh, potential uh, for the development of new uh, key players of the global stage, like China, India, Russia? Should we expect the uh, consolidation of new alliances 
models of uh, integration between uh, large countries that would uh, violate the current order? Yeah, well, I think that what's happening is that um, with the end of the Soviet Union, effectively, the alternative form of social, social and economic organization was ended and that since then has been a move towards market privatization, corporatization, competition and within that you've got then differences of a territorial kind. That is to say that there are different groups of corporate capital who are in competition one with another mm -hmm. and that, I th that is the way that I would look at the present st state of world politics but in other words I think there's a, a been a dominant block and that people in the left have talked about the periphery it's not periphery anymore it's what I call a, a, a counter uh, a counter block. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a counter core. I mean, there's a core to the world system, and people generally, people following Wallerstein, like, like alternative core. And? Like alternative core. To? Alternative core. Alternative, yes. yeah. It's an alternative, it's a counter, it's a counter core. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what's happening. That And uh, under uh, Yeltsin and then in the early Putin uh, regime, they wanted effectively to join, to be, become part of the dominant core. But that's been resisted by groups within the dominant core. So what has happened now? And again, a lot of people on the left, they still talk about these rising states as semi-peripheral states. They're not really, they're really competing states with the, the, the dominant um, core of the hege hegemonic capitalist core. I mean, China, to a lesser extent, uh, Russia uh, and, uh, uh, and India, they, they in, a way, in a way they are competing, but they're not competing, in my view, on a socialist basis. They're competing as different kind of alternative capitalist formations. Uh, political formations. I wouldn't say they're completely capitalist, but they are, they are uh, economic and political formations which are in competition. So, thank you very much for your time. Okay, that's even.